chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to begin this morning by looking at one verse. First Timothy chapter three, verse 16. And um, let's begin there. <clears throat> I tell you what, let's go back. No, that's all right. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Gather to... We pray for your divine wisdom to be with us all, to help us to understand, and to help us give honor where honor is due. You're an awesome God. We don't understand the things you do sometimes, nor the way you do it, but we do by faith trust in you. So thank you, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. There was a, <clears throat> a piece in the, in the paper this week, and, and I, I failed to pick it up this morning to bring it with me. But it had a quote on the front page, and I guess if you read the paper, I know you saw it, and you'll correct me. I do not remember the exact words that were there. I meant to do it. But it simply said something like, today we remember many and we honor all, or else we honor many but we remember all. Maybe that's where it was. Memorial Day. This is a special day in our country's history because of all the events that have taken place and for all of those who gave their lives for this country. As we look back, we, all of us in one way or another, have been touched by someone who gave their life for their country. This came about in around 1863. There was a lady who had gone to the cemetery. She had lost two sons in that war. The Civil War was a horrible war lost more there than any other war. And she went there to honor her two sons and she went over and placed wreaths on their grave, stood there for a little bit, and then she walked over to the other side of the cemetery and there were two more unmarked graves there. And she laid a wreath on them. Somebody happened to see her that knew her and walked over to her and Asked her, said, what are you doing? She said, don't you know those are graves of the Union soldiers, not ours? And she looked and she said, yes. She said, I understand that. But what I understand more is that there are two mothers, maybe two wives, that are missing their sons today. And I'm honoring them for them. Every one of us in here can think of and name someone that gave their all in war. I saw a stat this week that said there's over 1,100,000 that have died. Many of them gave their life heroically. Don't understand what causes a person to do certain acts. Don't understand the makeup of some people that would sacrifice themselves for others. We sitting here like this, basically, most of us, not all of us, but basically we would say, yeah, I don't think I could do that. 
and we hear of someone giving it in a special way and it cost them their life and we wonder why would they do that? What caused it? Some were killed and never knew it. It was instantly. Others, it was planned. They knew exactly what they were doing and they knew if they did it, it would probably cost them their lives, but they did it anyway. We call them heroes. But I would say to you that today that every man and woman that served in our military are heroes. Amen. We have many right here in this service that willingly gave their time knowing that it could cost them their life. You never enter into something like that not realizing it because we never know when war is going to break out. We never know where we're going to be. So we honor all of them today. Because of what that lady did, that is why we have Memorial Day as we know it today. It, <clears throat> it's a special event, and she wanted to start it to honor all of them. It was originally called Decoration Day to honor those who gave the ultimate sacrifice, gave their life. Jesus tells us in the book of John that no greater love hath anyone that he give his life for a friend. There will be celebrations going on all over this weekend. It is so great with us that we even have a holiday to celebrate it. So tomorrow we get to take off and celebrate in a special way. Get a long weekend. And many have gone to, like I said, gone camping, gone to the beach, gone different places to celebrate because of the long weekend. That's a good thing. But then come Tuesday, we'll go back to normal life. It'll be going back to work and going back and doing everything else. And some of those thoughts will be memories then. And may not be brought back up again until next year when we go to do it all over again. And that's a tragedy in itself. Because when someone gives all they have, they need to be remembered constantly. Our living soldiers, to them, we say thank you today. I don't know where they all served. I, I don't know what they all went through. But I'll tell you, I'm very privileged to have a brother that gave everything he had. It just didn't cost him his life. It cost him a lot. And I've always been thankful for David for the things he did. And we certainly honor all of you today. But I want to talk to you this morning about perhaps the greatest soldier that ever lived. And you can have various opinions on that. But I don't because it's very clear. When we think of Jesus Christ, we really don't want to say that he was a warrior. But if you define a warrior, what would it be? And I will tell you this morning. That Jesus Christ fits that bill as good as any man or any woman that ever was forced to go or chose to go. Someone in our everyday life, <clears throat> they volunteered. Then the lottery came along and they got drafted. All kind of things happened. Some went willingly, some fought it all the way. But in the end, they gave what they had. Think about a soldier. He's called to leave. I bet you you can remember members of your family. When it came time to leave, the long goodbyes you had, the thoughts you had. 
the special occasions that you had where they weren't there. The times they would come home and spend a few days, R&R, and, R, and then have to leave and go back. The times that you knew they were going into a war zone. And you had no clue whether or not you'd ever see them again. Those last goodbyes, they joined the military. They had to get rid of their clothes. They had to put on a special uniform. Used to be, back when Ricky was there, they'd shave their head. You lost everything that you held dear to you. They tried to take it from you. And for a good reason. They wanted to mold you and make you into something that you weren't. So they would use control. You'd wear a certain uniform. They'd cut your hair. You'd go to bed at a certain time. You'd get up at a certain time. You ate at a certain time. You obeyed orders, and you did do it back then. I understand the military is not the same anymore, but we're talking about the real military. <laughs> and I'm telling you, somehow you, you lost it all so they could replace it. And you became dependent upon them for everything you did. Everything. Your clothes, your food, your time, your training, everything. And they would tell you what to do and you would do it. Your response was, yes, sir. Jesus Christ did the same thing. Think for a moment. He was in heaven. There's no time in heaven. See, we live by the restraints of time. That's why we don't have time to do things that God would want us to do. Because we're, we're bad choosers of time, if that's a correct phrase. And we put other things ahead of God, and then when it comes to God's time, we don't have time. Oh, but there's coming a day when we get to heaven where there'll be no time. Therefore, we won't have to worry about it. Therefore, we'll be able to do everything God wants us to, and we'll do it because we want to. But when the time comes for God to send his son, he willingly decided to go to the battlefield. And he stepped out of time into time. Time now becomes a restraint to him. Time defines him. Regal robes he wore in heaven. He came here and was born as a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. The things that are in heaven, when he gave up that, it cost him everything. And whenever you see the old pictures of the GIs arriving at wherever their training is going to be, you have to wonder what's going through their minds because they're fixing to walk into a place. Now, I understand most of them were shouted at and screamed at and cursed at as soon as they got off the bus. Control. You have to wonder what went through their minds. And then they go into that new, new place. And I, again, I say stripped of everything, all of a sudden given everything. Jesus understood he had to come to the battlefield. He understood there would be a great war. He understood there would be great victory, but for any of that to happen, there would be a terrible, terrible price that he would have to pay. And he willingly did it. I don't believe that all of our soldiers willingly did it. But they went anyway. Jesus gave his life. Now, a soldier gives his life for his country. Just remember that. For the country. When Jesus came, he understood that he would give his life, but it would be for all humanity. Not just a country. All humanity. Yet he came anyway. Born of a virgin, he entered from eternity, a place of eternity, into a place of time. And I can't emphasize that enough. From no restraint to restraint. 
And he did it as a baby. He left his home in heaven. Came to a place that, as we see it, he didn't know because he came as a human. In heaven there was no sin. There was no pain. There was no suffering of any kind. There was no sorrow. There was no rejection. There was no hate. There was no hunger. There was no thirst. Think about it. That's what he gave up to come here to fight a battle that we could not fight for ourselves. He came to this sin cursed world that was full of hate, full of all vile, yet he came willingly. He wasn't forced, he stepped down to do something for us. That we never could do. In heaven he was exalted. In heaven he had it all. In heaven he was honored. In heaven he was worshipped. In heaven he was known as God. None like him. And he gave it all up. He gave it up to come here where he would be rejected. He would not be recognized as God anymore. He would be mortal man. He was ridiculed, hated, killed by men. He did not have a uniform on that showed him to be king of kings. In the military, you wear your outfit and you, you wear it proudly, and everybody, when they see it, they know you're in the military. You have ranks. I don't know all those ranks. I just know they've got stripes or stars or bars or something. He didn't have that. He looked like everybody else. He was no different as far as that was concerned. He didn't even have a bed. The Bible said he had no place to lay his head. He came from a place where he was everything and had everything. Needed no one. He came here for you and me to a place where he had not even a place to lay his head. He had came to a place where he was dependent on somebody else for everything he had. Everything. His mother clothed him. His mother fed him. His father trained him. His brothers and sisters fought with him. He was totally dependent on upon everybody else very much human that's what he gave up to come that's what he gave, gave up to come here to fight for me and you we owe him a lot and his appearing was with not great honor not great fanfare born in a barn think about it with the cows and the animals and the stench of that life his mom and daddy had nothing, no promise for him other than what he got every day. Yet he came because he knew he had a mission. And with those first few years, he depended upon them for all he had. And then, maybe 30 years, he now begins to do what he was sent to do. Every soldier takes training. Everything you do in the military takes training. I was peeling some potatoes the other day, and I thought about KP. They used to keep peeling. They don't do that anymore. No, we, we're modern army now. We don't do that. KP, can you imagine having to do KP? I bet Ricky could tell us some great stories about when he did KP. Be interested not what he did, but why he got put there. Interesting stories. But see, everything you do, you've got you to be trained for it. You try to choose a field that you want to be in, because they promised you you could do that, and then they had a surprise for you once you get there. But you train. You train how to shoot a gun. 
You train how to march. Everything about the military, you got to be trained. Jesus came to this earth and for 30 years or whatever, he was in some form of training. Oh, not the way that our modern army is now. But he was being trained for those things that lay ahead of him. And then it was time to step out. After the military has been trained, they'll send you to war. They'll send you to a hostile place. They'll send you in situations. Sometimes you choose, like I said, special forces, SEALs, Rangers. You choose different things. Some of them with greater risk, and you know that risk. Jesus chose one. He came to this earth to die, to set the nation, to set the whole humanity free of sin. That was his mission. He chose the most dangerous mission of all, and a mission that he knew he would never survive. Because the ultimate thing was to give his life, because the only way he could get what he wanted for us was to give his life through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Adam, the first man, failed. Now Jesus, the Son of God, who gave that all up and came down to be the son of Mary and Joseph, was given the same task. And he vowed he would not fail because all humanity depended upon it. So he begins his ministry going about teaching, trying to help. And it says here in this verse, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. The mystery of God. The mystery. God was manifest in the flesh. He was revealed in the flesh. He came as a baby. He was no different from me and you. His heritage was, but he left that behind. His greatness was, but he left that behind. He was revealed as a child. The world knew him as a man, not the son of God. Keep, keep remembering that. And then it says, manifested the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles. So this was the mystery that he came as a man. But yet, even coming as a man, it says that he now was justified by the Spirit. Everything that Jesus did, he did because of the Holy Spirit that dwelt within him. As he began his ministry, he was walking there in the desert and he comes to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is preaching the gospel of Jesus and baptizing people. And Jesus walks up. He's baptized by John. And the Bible says a dove comes and descends, lights upon him, signifying the Holy Spirit. This is why every one of God's children today need to seek the Holy Spirit in ways that we don't have it. The Holy Spirit is the power behind everything that we do. And the first thing he did was he armed himself with the power of God. Now, he was not God at this moment. Keep that in your mind. He was man. But he saw the need of the power of his father. And there he was baptized, and the father sent the power down, and now he is prepared to go into the greatest battle that mankind will ever face, and he was prepared to give his life for that cause through the power of Jesus Christ. So now he begins that journey, and he goes into there, and he begins to do everything that he is supposed to do, that he was sent here to do. He now performed miracles. He now began teaching about his father. Not like many of us do today, there are many teaching from pulpits today that have no power whatsoever behind what they're preaching. They're just saying beautiful words. They somehow are appealing to man's conscience. A feel good. Just a message. With no power behind it. I don't think I ever come into the pulpit that I don't pray for God's power and his strength. Because without that, I'm just saying beautiful words. I'm just saying something that anybody out there on the street can say. 
But we need the power of God to back up what we do today. Jesus needed the power of his father. And he got it. And he began to teach. And when he taught, people would listen. Now, they rejected. We understand that. There's always going to be that crowd. But they began to hear what he had to say. And they began to try to understand what he had to say. He would go about performing great miracles. Signs and wonders followed him. And signs and wonders were important because the people yet couldn't fully understand who he was. Even his own disciples did not understand that he was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They knew him as Jesus, the Son of Man, but not yet comprehending the Son of God. They didn't understand that when they saw him, they saw his Father. They couldn't understand that. And the reason being because they had not yet received the power to un give them wisdom and understanding. You and I need that power. We need to be able to know. See, if everybody on the earth today knew who Jesus Christ was, then every church in America would be full. There'd be nobody at the beaches. There'd be nobody out doing something else. Everybody would be in God's house honoring him memorializing him today on this special day because he was the greatest warrior to ever live and he gave his ultimate life so that you and I could live and live free. Hallelujah. It says that he was justified in the spirit. That means the Holy Spirit, when it came down upon him, it justified him as being Jesus that was anointed by the power of his father. Justified. When he said, I am, exactly that's what it meant. He was justified in his coming, justified by his father. This is my son in whom I am well pleased, justified. But it also said not only was he justified by God himself, but he was seen of angels, seen of angels. Think about all the times that the angels appeared with Jesus when he's on earth. They were there at his birth. They were there when he was tempted out in the, and in the wilderness they were there whenever he walked with his disciples. They were there whenever he got to the point that he would perform the miracles. They were there. It says that they were there at the tomb. They were there when he was ascended back up into heaven. Throughout his life, he was seen by angels. They were there to put their crowning effect upon him. He had left heaven. Oh, but heaven never left him. What a thought. Never left him. And whenever you and I begin to take up our cross, and when you and I begin to be the warriors that God's called us to be, he will never, ever leave us. No matter where we go, no matter what we do, no matter the challenge that faces us, Christ will never, ever leave us. In our greatest hours, he's there to help us to make sure that we stay humble. And in our hardest hours, he's there to help our faith to be strong, to trust him and to believe in him. He'll never leave us, never forsake us. He's always there. But not long was he seen by angels, he was preached unto the believers. Preached. His gospel was for everybody. Everybody would not accept him. But he still preached the gospel. Not only did he preach the gospel, but he trained his disciples he trained his followers so that they too could get a hold of this truth. And once they got the power that he had, they could begin to preach the gospel with the same power that Jesus did. Do you understand that Jesus wants us to have that same power? He does. The things you've seen me do, you shall do also. And even greater things than these shall you do. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. If we choose not to have it, if we, if we choose not to pursue it, then we will just exist on this earth and be like everybody else. But with that power, we become men and women of God that have great understanding of the wisdom of God. And that wisdom of God will enable us to look at situations through the eyes of God speak through the mouth of God and watch great things happen through the power of God and we'll have a love to do it to everybody that we see. Think about it. I can do all things through the power of God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How does God strengthen me? It's not in my muscles that I don't have now. 
It's through a power within me that gives me to do the ability of anything for God that I choose to do. So when you're asked to do something, you say, well, I just don't think so. That shows you're lacking the power of God. It's showing that you don't have the desire and the determination to be what God called you to be. It doesn't mean we're going to like everything that we're chosen to do. It doesn't mean that we're going to like being in church every time the doors are open. It doesn't mean we're going to like being in Sunday school. We're going to like coming to Saturday night prayer. It doesn't mean that. But what it means is I have such a power living within me that I'm going to do it whether I like it or not because I understand this. If I do what God's called me to do, I will do great things and others' lives will be changed because of it. Amen. Think about that. The power that causes us to choose right things right now in our lives. You look at this world and this world is so fast it is ridiculous. But that should not be said about God's people. As the world gets darker, God's people should get brighter. It's not that we should allow the darkness to take over part of us, but we should allow the light in us to take over part of the darkness. He says, I am the light of the world. And he said, I send you to be the light of the world. And we can do that and we can make a difference if we understand the power that's within us. The power of God will enable our young people to choose the right mate. The power of God. It's not what I want, God. It's what you want. Now, God, here's what I want. And you send this person to me as your gift to me and believe that you're going to be able to do it through Christ. To us adults, it's, you know, the power of God enables us to choose a job that God has for us. That God has for us. We like to look at money. We like to look at closeness. We like to look at a lot of things. And sometimes we get so caught up in that because we're weak that we're striving to get those things and we forget what God wants for us. The greatest job that you could have in the world is a job where God places you. It has nothing to do with finances, where you are, what you are, what your title is. Those are things of the world. God says, seek me first and I will give you everything else you need. We say, when I get what I need to sustain my life and to keep it, then I'll give God something. You see, we don't understand that because it is the power of God that brings reasoning to our lives. And Jesus understood what he was going through. He understood the things there. He understood that he had to be a perfect sacrifice, a sacrifice that had been raised to die. What is God's purpose for you? We're all sacrifices today. He said, like lambs before the slaughter. We all have to make sacrifices. We make some in this world that we don't like. We make some we do like. But every day of our lives, we're having to make choices for God. Sacrifices. When's the last sacrifice you made? This morning I come to church. <laughs> that's not a sacrifice. Reading your Bible and praying, that's not sacrifices. See, a sacrifice is just something that you give where you put yourself down and raise God up. A sacrifice is something where you say, God, not my will, but thine be done. A sacrifice calls you out to come out of your easy place, your soft place, your fun place, your resting place, to give it up to go to a place where God wants you to do something special for him. See, a sacrifice costs you something or it's not a sacrifice. We've got to learn to do it. We sacrifice for the world every day. You sacrifice on your job every day. Oh, the, wor the, your, the world is so good to y'all, it gives you tomorrow off. Isn't that a good job? Isn't that wonderful? You, our jobs are so great. You get tomorrow off. Well, you're not good to me because my day off is on Monday. And that's when the holiday falls. Is that crazy or what? I don't get the holiday. So I'll take Tuesday. While y'all go back to work, I'll take Tuesday. And then one of you will get sick. But isn't your job so good you'd give you a day off? Did you see in, in, did you see in the news this week a 
a guy won the lottery and got $12 million. You know what the first thing he did? He went to a company and gave them $285,000 to take 20 tons of manure and dump it in his boss's yard. <laughs> he did. When they had dumped 10 tons of it, the boss heard the noise, went outside, called the police, but he already dumped 10. The guy had his photo when they arrested him. He had his photo. And he's standing there with that little plate and his number, and he's doing this. And he was released, and then he told the newspaper. He said, stay tuned. There's more coming. <laughs> he said, for all those years, my boss humiliated me. He was bad to me. He was ugly. I hated every moment of it. And now I got my revenge. See, our bosses are so good to us. We love them, everyone. If you loved your bosses as much as I love mine, you'd have a great job because I got the greatest position in the world, not a job, position in the world. I'm blessed. But I want to tell you something. When we serve God and his army, it would be the greatest job if we're going to call it a job we've ever had in our lives, and we would willingly give everything for him. You've got to get to that point in your Christian life if you're going to be a Christian. It's no longer about whether, you know, I want to sing in the choir. I don't want to sing in the choir. I just don't know. It, it has nothing to do with what you want. What does God want you to do? It's not about whether I want to preach or whether I don't want to preach. It's about what God wants you to do. It's not about whether I'm going to church tonight or not. It's about what God wants you to do. The greatest warrior that ever lived gave his life so that you and I could be free. I think we owe him something. I think we owe him something. Lastly, this morning, we talk about his ascension. The last thing it says, and they received him unto glory. He came a man as a child, did all those things, and then went back I heard someone talking this week and they were talking about his death and resurrection and they said what Jesus did on that cross was the greatest event that ever happened he was resurrected from the dead and he ascended into heaven because he died. If he had not died on that cross, he had never been raised from the dead. He had never ascended back up to heaven. So see, everything goes back to Calvary. It goes back to that choice that he made in heaven. To come here and be the perfect sacrifice. To live a perfect life. And then to give that life for even those who hated him the most. And then down Calvary, the cruelest death that man had ever invented at that time, hung between two thieves, yet he did it, and looked down, and he said, Father, would you please forgive them? They just don't know what they're doing. He loved them to the end, asked for their forgiveness to the very end. You and I, when we become those soldiers, Christ may not call for us to be, to die on a cross. He may not call for us to die a cruel death. But death is coming. Oh, unless we do the resurrection or 
he comes back and gets us. Think about it. Other than that, death. So he's asking us whether you die a natural death or whether I come and take you home. doesn't matter. When that moment comes in your life, will you be able to say that I did my best? Jesus could say that. He proved it by his last words. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. You and I, someone does us wrong, we go ahead and get them. We go ahead and get them. Someone does us wrong, we just, our prayer, next prayer is, Father, strike them dead. Go ahead and get rid of them. Save me the problem. It's because we don't have the power within us to love like God does. The reason we don't have that power is because we haven't sought it. See, he is love. And when he comes into our heart like he should, and we ask for him to give us the power to use that love, he will. There Jesus cried and he said, Father, if there be any other way, any other way for this to happen, let it happen. Oh, but understand this, Dad. Your will done. doesn't matter to me. I got my brothers, my druthers, but I'll do what you want. And he walked right to that cross. He gave it freely. Why? Because that power that he received when he began his ministry was there to help him to walk that last step. To be raised up and to look down in love and say, Father, forgive them. Church, that's what you and I need. He is the perfect example of the perfect warrior who gave everything, held nothing back, even to those who hated him. Memorial Day. Yeah, we, we're honoring him. We're remembering him. But you do not honor him one day out of the year. He deserves every day to be Memorial Day as we honor that warrior. And if we want to ever emulate a warrior, we, want, we ever want to emulate someone that was great at what he did, then let us choose today to honor him and to be like him. And it takes a commitment, and that commitment is sealed by the Holy Spirit. Pray for that power to change your life today. Father, we are grateful for all that you have done. We don't even know all the things. What we do know is why you did what you did. We don't know about all the healings. We don't know about all the teachings, the times that you raised all the people from the dead. It's not recorded. We don't know. But what we do know is why you did it. And God, it's because you had godly love that was controlled by the power of the Holy Spirit. Within every one of your children, your soldiers, is godly love. It's there. Because you're in them. So they have your love. But too many of us are satisfied with having the love and not using it. See, we don't go that next step and pray for the power to enable us to love the way that you love, to give the way that you give, to do the things you do. We don't have it. And that's why sometimes we don't care about the things of God. That's why the world can talk us out of doing the things of God. That's why it's easier to stay sometimes rather than go. Because the power is not there to control us. So God, I pray today that each and every one of us, as soldiers of the cross, will pray for that power to lift us and to encourage us and to strengthen us in all that we do. Let us choose that today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before you leave, I forgot, we need to take up the offering real quick. I'm sorry. Uh,